So the title, I was trying to figure out a title because again, it's, just, it's a recap of what I experienced at the fifth annual global bio ag tech conference, but it was a really a way to mesh my experiences. So I just titled it basically from the idea to the market, my, my five key insights when bringing the biological to the market. And why, why can I talk about this or why do I feel confident talking about this? Um, it's because I've been I've on farm experience of over 15 years. I was in a major global R&D uh, organization for a biologicals company called Novozymes Biologicals. They're now Novonesis. They, they've just merged with Christian Hansen. So I got what it looked like to bring up market, a biological to market in a big global company. And then the last two years, I was really working with commercialization in a biological startup. So I really was able to get the best of both worlds and trying to figure out, you know, what each company does in the global biologicals market. And then I just put some of the random things that I've done in the ag space. Um, I've been in here for a long time. I've milked cows. I've been a vet tech. You know, I'm a research physiologist. I've been programming. I mean, you name it, I've touched it at some point in, in the ag supply chain. Um, so that's a little bit about me. I'm down here in North Carolina right now in, in Wake Forest. So I'm really close to the Research Triangle Park. I'm really trying to get integrated into the ag tech and animal tech startup culture down here because I do feel like there's been a, a little bit of a disconnect over the past couple of years about the, the types of products being brought to the market and how they're being brought to the market. Um, so that's kind of where my passion is. And and that's uh, why I wanted to attend the last conference, the, the BioAg Tech conference, because I wanted to see kind of what the market in, it, in itself was saying about itself. Um, this conference was a conference for the industry by the industry. So there was no farmers, there was very few like vendors that weren't already in the biological space. And then you had big ag and you know, late stage startups and early stage startups. Uh, so the tone of this conference was really like, again, how do you bring your biologic, biological to market? There was a lot of um, big ag talking to, to the audience. Um, so that's kind of, again, why the presentation is geared towards that. Like, how do you bring a biological to market? So let's level set real quick, just in case... Um, we all aren't on the same page. What are biologicals? Really, they're any input that's biologically derived. And so this is like a very wide range of products. You know, they could be microbes, they could be fungi, ladybugs. I've seen I've seen farmers or, you know, gardeners or nursery um, owners purchase ladybugs to bring in to kill their aphids. That's a biological. Um, lipids, plant hormones, biochar salts, anything like that. It can be live, it can be dead, it can be inert. It just has to be biologically derived. Contrary to that is chemistry. So a lot of big ag will say chemistry, chemistry. That's anything that's chemically derived. Anything that's in the lab used chemistry to create. That's just the, uh, the delineation there. And biological companies use so many different names to mean the same thing biologicals, biosolutions. A lot of them now are saying this is a sustainable product. This is a regenerative product. You know, I've bio ag, green, natural compounds. Really, the industry uses whatever they can to differentiate between themselves. And then the- Whitney, I wanna... Whitney can I just stop right there? Because I'd like yeah. to bring Pablo into this one too. So if we want to move away from a chemistry-based input system to a biological-based input system. I know sometimes you'll say, well, the vehicle doesn't matter as much as the destination. What do you think about using some of those terms to, to move that narrative, you know, to, to the human psyche to accept these things more readily or, or, or clamor for them? What, what do I think about that? I, I think you need to, there's the way that you talk to industry is not the way you talk to the consumer. Uh, is the first thing. So you have to be very transparent. You have to use very simple terms. You have to use infographics, right? And you have to anticipate a little bit, like we could just probably sit here for the next half hour and imagine all the crazy ideas and mis and disinformation that people are going to put out there, right? This is GMO, but now with, with things that are other than plants, 
right? So all those same topics are going to come up. And I hope that somebody in industry is thinking about how do we communicate this to the consumer in a way so we can avoid some of the issues we've had in the past. Yeah. Um, especially like when you get into like the plant hormones, I can only imagine the narrative around, around that. Right. And it, and there are a lot of out there already being sold. Right. But I don't think people realize that they're a plant hormone and they're really good products actually. And they do really cool things, but, um, I can't hear you over the chemtrails. <laughs> Exactly. Exactly. Sorry. Um, exactly. And just, you know, for, as an example, I, I highlighted this on the right is a, is a soybean root with nodules. The little like bubbles are nodules. And that is a great way to visualize a biological rhizobia form a symbiotic relationship with the soybean root. They form these amazing nodules. The rhizobia give the plant nitrogen and the plant gives the rhizobia like starches and sugars and things like that. So I just like to use that as the visual because usually you can't visualize a, a peptide or a, a microbe. And in the industry, we've kind of created these three major categories, biofertilizers, bio, bio control or biological control, and biostimulants. Biofertilizers are anything that enhance nutrient cycling in the soil. A lot of times you'll hear it being called a bio yield product. Um, the biocontrol is just a crop protectant from disease or infestation. Think of biopesticide, bioherbicide, bioinsecticide, things like that. And then a biostimulant enhances plant growth through a physiological pathway within the plant. And I really love this schematic on the right because it shows, A, how much overlap there is within the same product, right? Like, so like humic acids can be a biostimulant or, or a biofertilizer. And so in the industry, we can't really agree on certain bio biologicals being in what group. And, and I also want to make the delineation here that this is not the regulatory and registration nomenclature some of it can be but this is not what the registration uses um all the time which we'll get to in a little bit so what the, i yeah i'm sorry can i just yeah. as a trivial example here of this is just bad marketing right if you say biopesticides right or if you say uh bt toxins most people's brains are going to go to, well, these are bioweapons. This is a Geneva Convention violation, right? That, that That's, people are immediately going to go to that. Now, the saving grace is that ag is a non-politically charged discussion, right? Both the Democrats and the Republicans like it. So you just have to fight the environmentalists uh, and the animal rights people, which is not insignificant, but maybe explaining these terms and you're doing a great job at explaining these terms in ways that consumers can understand. Oh, for sure. For okay. sure. Yeah. Bioweapon. Just... Bio <laughs> yeah. yeah. I'm, just, I'm just telling you. I mean, you know, some of them <laughs> are killing species. So, um, uh, yeah, it is, it, these are definitely the categories we use within the industry, within the industry to, to, label products um but it's i mean you'll see biocontrol is definitely the what's used out into the consumers more often than not um and yeah, yeah. The, the the challenge the challenge comes in right and I, I spoke about this uh at a uh conference over in europe the minor use foundation that's what it was um that the, the companies that are putting out these products, God bless them, are putting out the MSDS sheets to inform their customers. And the MSDS sheets still have the industry terms. And then when you read an MSDS sheet, there's all sorts of fun terms like toxicity. It doesn't matter that it's, you know, 100 parts per million and industry goes, well, we're not going to, you know, get anywhere close to that, you know, not even within 100 times of that, because that's not explained. Yep. Okay. Sorry. Oh, yep. Oh I'll yeah, for sure. Oh, for sure. For sure. Um, yeah, there's, um, I don't know if the biologicals 
we're getting better. We're getting better at putting information out there for the consumer that is different than the farmer, right? I don't know if we've done a great job at that, um, which I think is another reason why farming in general has um, been, there's a, it's, it's a black box, I think, to a lot of consumers because they're so far removed and we're not talking to them, right? We're talking to either farmer to farmer or things like that. So it had, I'll get to it, but there is an education piece that I heard this week that people are, are recognizing that we have to get better at that. Um, one of the things that I was kind of shocked that I didn't hear more about in the in the conference is carbon sequestration. And so I put this here, that would not fit in one of these three boxes. I heard it once. I heard it from one person in one of their talk all week about carbon se sequestration products that fit into this like environmental bucket. So we'll see how much that grows. I know there's products out there already that their sole mode of action is to sequester carbon in the soil. Um, but maybe that grows, maybe that gets cannibalized into a different group. I don't know. We'll see. It was interesting. So <clears throat> that's just the background. If anybody else have any other questions, just kind of level setting with what the terminology I'll be using. I'm going to transition into what my five key insights are for a growing bioag industry. This, this graph was shown a couple of times in a, in a couple of different ways that this market is really growing, you know, so it's already about 15 billion us dollars. And by 2035, they're predicting it to be about 43 billion us dollars. So it, it is growing, you know, it has the annual growth rate of about 10% is what they're, they're predicting. So this is a sizable market and it's going to continue. And you'll see later in the presentation, I think government has a really big part in how each country grows in this arena, um, which will be kind of fun. So my first insight um, is that big ag. So the Syngenta is the um, Bayer is the BAS. They're investing in companies and not products. Now that's overgeneralized. I'm sure they have their own R and D, and I'm sure they're creating biologicals in their R and D. But from this conference, it was absolutely clear that they're investing as much, if not more, in companies. And to me, this is just my opinion. I think it's because the market is still unsure of where the biologicals fit. We, we can't really figure out a good go-to-market strategy. There's been a massive amount of predictions, market predictions, that this new product is going to have this much market share, and it falls absolutely on its face. So big ag can't figure out where bi biologicals kind of fit in the market. They can't figure out how to sell them to farmers. They can't figure out where they fit in distribution because they're trying to fit them into a whole a whole industry that includes chemistries, right? So what big ag is doing is they're investing in the startups. They're letting startups kind of figure out how to bring it to market, what's working, what isn't working. And then we're just going to learn in that iterative process. Additionally, the cost of innov innovation and commercializations for biologicals is astronomical. And so what I also think they're doing is they're splitting the cost. So multiple big companies are going in and investing in multiple of the same startups, right? So they're able to leverage that money across um, the industry, get these products to market, and then if the startups don't quite make it, they're going to acquire their technologies. And we're already seeing that happen. And then again, they're, we're forming a lot of partnerships as well. So we're seeing a lot of more consolidation, a lot of partnerships, a lot of acquisitions. And so it really, we're just trying to figure out how to get this market or this industry off the ground. And I think we're seeing it this way. Um, just recently, Ag Biome, which was a pretty late stage startup ended up just not quite making it to the finish line and they ended up kind of folding. And then Certus got their commercial products, Ginkgo Bioworks got their whole strain library, and then their like their assets 
um, their, you know, their, their capital assets um, are being kind of utilized down here. So we're just going to see a lot more of that um, over time. And I think that's, it's super normal for an early industry industry because there's so many players in it right now. Whitney. Yeah. Um, I'd like to bring Maureen into the conversation of a question for her. So Maureen, when one of these large companies acquires these startups for their for their biological IP and not knowing whether they're going to make it or not, but basically saying swim, and if you don't swim, we're just going to take your bones and and um, absorb them. Is there an opportunity for an agency like yours or another agency out there that could step in and support these companies that have been acquired? Is that normal? I, I don't know that side of the business. In in what way? You mean to for us Promote to work with them, the company you know, that in, has acquired them? Yeah, so you've, you've acquired this company. Now we need to go to market strategy and, and execution. Yes. And Franz, I know you mentioned your specialty is go to market as well. So um, yes, we can we do that sort of thing. And, and like I said, I know Franz can contribute to that as well. So I think our skill set in a scenario like that is how does the strategic communication structure look for the company that acquired them? as well as the company that has been acquired? Are they going to continue, and the brand relationship there, are they going to continue to operate independently? Are they going to be folded under that umbrella? Does the brand need to get some sort of tagline that it's now powered by the acquired company? So there's a lot to solve in those scenarios from a strategic and brand perspective, as well as go-to-market strategy stuff in terms of you know getting the you know market share growing and getting them more customers and that sort of thing. What do you have to add to that, Franz? I, I, I would agree for it. Uh, you know, it is, uh, I, I'm, I'm a little bit shy here because uh, um, I'm, I'm not an expert in this, in this, in this, uh, in this market section, but, but uh, what, what I, uh, what I'm thinking about is the, um, graduation from from applied sciences to 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 uh, uh business solutions um and 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 that i think is is uh where this industry is at this moment you know and 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 that that makes it uh, harder for 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 pinpointing who the customers are uh, might also mean by or indicate why why companies are looking at uh, or investors are looking at investing in a company instead of in in products. Um, so there there's there's still a lot of 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 uh, of, of business development uh, ahead for the industry. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I agree. I think That's you, Whitney. <laughs> yeah, we just haven't quite figured out who the ideal customer is i think is is it um anyway we'll, we'll move on i think because and i think this is part of it um it's been clear that we no longer believe that biologicals will be a standalone product at least right now in the near future biologicals will not just replace standard practices they will become, and if I had to, like, by the end of the week, the tool, the toolbox analogy was used so much. I had to put it on here, but it's like, farmers just want another tool in their toolbox. Big Ag just wants another tool in their toolbox to then give to farmers. And then distribution just wants another tool in their tool. So it's, it isn't going to be a swap out. It's not going to be, hey, use this instead of your urea. Hey, use this instead of your chemistry. It's really going to be another thing on the shelf for, for farmers to be able to use. And with that, the, the whole thing was find your niche and then test your synergies and capabilities. This isn't going to be... I, so when I started out 10 years ago, we were looking at trying to find one microbe to put on the seed to sell on every single soybean seed across the entire country. And it's going to boost bushels by 15, you know, bushels per acre, right? Like that was the original idea. That is no longer 
the 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 beacon the benchmark um and so people are really finding their niche niches where are they where do they work the best what are the the environmental conditions that it works the best and then test your synergies and compatibilities with what's on the market right now figure out what works with it figure out what doesn't work with it and go from there and then another key thing that i think the industry is trying to wrap their head around and they think they're really sad about is that farmers will not pay a premium just because it's a biological product. And so for so long, which I think has been a reason for the slow adoption, at least here in the United States, is people are like, it's biological, pay an extra 10%, right? And it's just not happening and it will not happen. And I think, I think finally <laughs> the industry, um, is coming to, to terms with it. Um, so, so I think that was good. Um, any input, any insights? Do you want to challenge anybody want to challenge here? Well, I just, what, what does price parity look like right now between the biologicals and chemicals? Is it, is it drastic? Are they in the same ballpark? I don't have a good answer for that. I'm going to take a little bit of a stab in the dark. I don't think it's huge. Um, but it is it is slightly higher because they're touting biologicals. Um, but I mean, so I'm, as I'm I'm in the food. I just came out of a venture thing in the food space, and it's the better for you labels, you know, and it, and it's getting that price point parity. Yeah, it's better for you, but if you're not selling your ice cream at seven ninety nine a pint, you you still aren't going to generate the velocity you need. So, and I remember that when we were doing the um, cell based meat, you know, getting that plate parity down to where it needed to be at that point in time. Because once you hit that magic number, then it then you know kind of falls into Pablo's place. You know, you play defense and you get the the right words out there to get the consumers in, in line with it. And once they demand it, then then it just flows upstream. Well, you, the, the other ways you can do it is you can offset offset the cost in other ways, right? Like governments can provide incentives for using biologics as opposed to using something else. Uh, then there's the whole like labeling thing. People, bad example. I know no nobody uh, nobody going conniptions, but organic sells because people think it means something it doesn't mean what they think it means but that's a separate that's a separate thing so biologics could definitely do something like that in which case the consumers go yeah i'll pay a little bit more because it's biologic not chemical which is also not true but that's that's a separate thing the the issue is going to be is that the most of the time the consumer isn't okay let's let's back up in the supply chain right so let's just say we have Cheerios that are made with biologicals, right? A lot of things is becoming this regen. Biologicals fit into this regen thing. So Cheerios, you know, these are regen Cheerios or whatever, right? The consumer pays a premium for that. Chances are that that premium that the consumer is going to pay for that box of Cheerios probably doesn't make it all the way back to that farmer, right? So we got to target the middle of the supply chain or or other places where we can we can do this um, paying the premium, right? The grain elevators, I use the grain elevators and I use co milk co-ops as the, as the example, right? You have grain from multiple farms coming into these grain elevators or milk from multiple farms coming into these co-ops. And now you're getting regen milk or biological based milk, whatever you want to call it, mixing in with, with other stuff. So I think that's part of the problem right now is the way the system's set up. We're not we're not set up to be able to really pay the farmers a premium on this stuff yet. No, no, we're not. But these are the discussions we have with government when they go through and set up the farm bill and go, listen, you should provide subsidies for this. Hey, build back better or or whatever the next infrastructure. Part of that should be uh, the logistic chains for food, right? It's a, it's a presidentially uh, mandated national critical infrastructure, and yet you've sunk no money into the infrastructure. Um, what, what COVID showed us is we have very fragile logistic chains, and that is highlighted by a point you made earlier that most people are so far removed from where their food comes from that there's no other option that than, you know, long transport. So, Let's let's have the country invest in some of that. For sure. Sorry, I'm preaching to the choir. I know. I'm sorry. I could. I. I. Yes. I could spend a whole hour just talking about that. I worked on a little bit of that in my last my last role, trying to connect the pieces a little bit. Um, you know, kind of like create like a circumvented supply chain 
for some of this technology, um, but that's also hard. Also, I want to just bring up that again, because this isn't a, because this isn't replacing technologies in my mind, they almost need to be less than chemistries, right? Because we're not asking, we're not saying, hey, switch out and swap out, right? Therefore, it's the same price, but we're swapping it out. It's like, no, we're, we're kind of at this point asking you to add one more input. Now, you might be able to prolong you know, your, your integrated pest management, right? If you use this biological control, then maybe you can, you know, reduce or whatever, but, um, really we're not, we're not quite there yet. Um, so the price things is a problem. My, my next thing is stop selling directly to the farmer. Um, that has been, we've been struggling with this for a while in the industry. There's already, amazing distribution set up in the United States for selling your product. If you're a small to medium startup and you're trying to sell directly to the farmer, it's just not working. And I think we've seen that with some of the recent folding of startup companies because you're hiring a sales force, you're making con you know connections, you're doing all this stuff and farmers are only going to buy products from people that they trust. So the time to create that trusting relationship getting it in and then figuring out where your product fits into the market. It's just, just partner with a key distributor. <laughs> that is where you need to go. And please limit your geographic region. You know, I've seen so many people just trying to get it across the United States and it's just not going to work at the beginning. You know, that's a way more mature type of mindset where you've got a massive bank behind you where you can, you know, pay for all the field trials needed. Um, so there was some really good talks about leaders of distribution and, you know, coalitions and things like that, kind of talking to the crowd about just partner with us early, figure out who you, who you want to figure out where you want to sell and what you want to sell, figure out your distribution early, contact us and we'll work with you as you go. Like don't, don't develop your product and then come to us and be like, sell it, right? Develop that relationship with us through the process, get our input, figure out what we need, figure out how we can do it. And then it will just, the, as soon as you're done with your product, we can get it on the market versus what I've seen is people do the whole product development. And then there's another whole year trying to get it into distribution. Well, that's, you know, wasted time. And then educate, educate, educate. I've already brought this up. That has been an, another theme. You want to educate the consumer. You want to educate the farmer. And you want to educate your distribution. You have to do it all at the same time throughout the process. So that when you're done with your product development, you are ready to launch. And that there's no delay. Educate, educate, educate. Mm -hmm. If I could jump in real quick, yeah. just as a exact example of that. I don't know if any of you guys are familiar with Indigo Ag. I just Google them again. Apparently they're still around, but they went <laughs> all around selling this brand. I could never get one of those guys to explain to me, A, what they were selling, B, why they were selling it. And they went to, I, I knew dozens of farmers in the tri-state region I worked in at the time that they tried to sell their kind of carbon trading, whatever their scheme was. They didn't get a single farmer to take them on board. And it wasn't just that they couldn't explain their product, but the more important thing is that those guys didn't trust them. Some salesman shows up from Boston, from Nashville. Hey, we got this slick new thing. The farmer's like, what are you trying to sell me, man? And what is it? And when they couldn't explain it, A, I don't know you. B, you can't explain it. Bye. They didn't have time for them. And, I, and I, I, they approached hundreds of farmers that I knew of, and they didn't get a single one to take it on. So your point about you can't hit farmers. They got stuff to do, man. They're busy. And you better hit them with something that was coming up with somebody from someone they trust. And it better be something that's real and on the ground that's going to work for them. Otherwise, they're going to... And those indigo egg guys, they, they, the farmers talk. And they're like, do those weirdos talk to you? Yep. And they were done. Done, done, done. They never had a shot after they blew their first few sales. So anyway, I don't know what yeah. happened to those guys, but... <laughs> They just, yeah. So Indigo was at the conference. I thought it was interesting because they just hired a new CEO and they've come in and completely revamped. They laid off again. 
they're prioritizing, um, they have like their tech platform and then I forget what else they have. Who knows? Um, like three different revamps within like six months. And I knew one of their salesmen personally, he's like, we don't even know what we're trying to do. So I'm like, yeah. well, there's no chance the farmers I know are going to take, take you up on it because they have too much on the line and you're just, you know, so anyway, to your point, you would be, I get those clients like all the time. You would be amazed how many people there is, I will not name who this is, but there was a company that I met at a conference that had four co-founders, $10 million raised in their, in their series A. I think they were series A. None of the four co-founders, I met them all at different ag conferences across upstate New York at different times. Not one of them could explain the, the company, the tech, what they, what their what they were doing in any sort of way that was clear. You go on their website, it was all over the place. And that is incredibly common. So when you find those people, send them to me. I can help them with their messaging strategy <laughs> to well, add gotta, some clarity to that something sort of thing. behind their message. So yeah, maybe that was their problem. But I, I think it was that. And then yeah. me, but as what he said, the, the farmers just didn't trust them. Like, who are you? Right. They, yeah, they, their they sales approach was wrong. to anybody. And and they at right. the time I was managing properties and they tried to get me to go out there and talk. I'm like, are you out of your mind? I'm not going to put my credibility on you. I, you can't explain it to me. It reminded me a little of of I've, to this day I've never had anyone be able to explain crypto to me in a way that makes sense. And so <laughs> and I don't know, I'm not trying to open a can of worms there, but like again, if I don't understand it, I'm with Warren Buffett. I'm not. I ain't doing it. So and the farmers yeah. feel the same way. Yeah. Totally and agree. Think, yeah. And I think using the distribution as your litmus test is huge, right? If you can't get the distribution on board and understanding your product and they they understand where it fits in the market, right? They want, and that's what I heard. They want biologicals. They're not saying, do not come to me with them. They're like, come to me with your biologicals. How does it work? What makes it different? How do my people sell it? And it's like, People can't even give the give them those three things, right? And so use the distribution early and as your litmus test. If you can't get them on board, you're never getting a farmer on board, ever. Um, and I think that's and I, and and as a company, you're paying. Even if you only had like five salespeople, what are you? Their salaries, their travel, their. I mean, it's a sales department is huge, right? Instead, have a couple key salespeople in your company that's business development that are developing these uh, distribution partners um, and do it and limit your geographic region too. They're like, don't go to the Wilbur Ellis's, don't go to the giant ones and be like, please sell this across the nation. Like prove yourself in a small area first and then grow. Don't go right to the, you know, big guys or gals. Uh well, Franz, I think Franz, did you have something you wanted to add? Yeah, no, it is. It is. Uh, uh, we need to touch on, on on a lot of that. It is. It is. It is almost like the chicken and the egg. You know, it is not the chicken or the egg. It is. It is because the distributors are not going to sell you product unless you come to them with a use case, and you're not going to get that without without a farmer. So it is. Um, but that 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 getting a buy in from a farmer. Uh, you, you, if, if you're developing these products, you have to do it with a farmer that, is, that, that trusts you <laughs> and, and, and that, that is willing to go down that road with you. Uh, so, so, and, and then you have to need have to, once you have the business case, then you have the positioning, then you, you, you kind of know what the, uh, you have a good idea of what the trigger points for, for, uh, for, for buying and selling uh, the, the, the value proposition are. And, and then, then the, the um, distributors, uh, uh, will 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 amplify it further. You know, if if you make it easier for them, if you do that whole channel management uh, and touch on all those elements in, in that whole chain, that is indeed the chicken and the egg. Yes, yes, well said. I yes, all of it. Like, do it for them, and that like like the the distribution people said, just come to us early. We can tell you what we need. It's not. It's not. We don't not know <laughs> like so it's, if you know from the beginning that that's what you're going to do you can develop it along the way right you can get that use case before you're trying to launch so um 
All right. I am not a regulatory expert, so don't ask me too many regulatory questions, but I've been in this long enough to know that it's complicated. Um, so you have to understand the regulatory pathways early. Again, it's just like distribution. What's your go-to-market strategy? Part of that is understanding regulatory. And each bucket, right? The biocontrol, the biostimulants and biofertilizers, they all have a different pathway. Each country has a different, you know, so figure out what your strategy is, understand it, either hire somebody. There are, at the conference, there's a couple like uh, working groups that work with like the EPA, if you're biocontrol and, and the companies to help you figure out what you need, right? They said, again, come to us early. Tell us what you're trying to do. We'll tell you what you need. Don't just try to go into it thinking that you have what you need. And then when you go to launch, you just don't have the registration um, dossier needed. So product registrations remain the major contributor to cost of product development. Um, in the U.S., you have some states that require three years of trial field trials before you can register in that state. Other states are like, I don't care, just register it. If it's biocontrol, you're going through the EPA, which is another whole you know set of costs and, and types of trial. Um, so you want to get it right, and you don't want to have to do anything extra. Um, so that also goes back to keep your geographic region small at first. Don't try to launch globally before you've started getting sales regionally. Figure out your test case, like figure out your best case scenario, go after that, and then expand as you're bringing in revenue. The U.S. registration process is in inconsistent. What one state calls the, you know, what one state defines as a biological fertilizer is different than the next and blah, 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 blah. And then, and then you have California, right? That's out there in its own um, um, whole process. You know, so usually we say if you go to California and you can meet their requirements, you usually can um, meet, but then you have some states that will not accept field trial data in any, from other, any other state except their own state. So it's, it's, complicated and and just figure it out early um this graph that i'm showing here is super cool i really love it they brought up brazil um as what i think is going to be the test case for i don't know if it's reduced regulatory hurdles or maybe just clearer or simplified regulatory whatever you want to call it about five years ago brazil revamp the way that biologicals can be brought to market in their country. And so what they did um, with this study is they asked about, you know, 5,000 farmers these qu some questions about biocontrol, biostimulants, and biofertilizers, okay? And then they just took the percent of that, you know, 5,000 and created these graphs. So the top is Brazil, and the, the one right below it is the U.S., Okay. 55% of the farmers are using a biocontrol in Brazil compared to 6% in the United States. And then you can see 50 to 16 and 36 to 12 as you go through. You have the white space that are not using and not planning to use. Ours is much bigger in certain categories. But what I find is find it to be amazing, and it goes back to the education, 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 34% of the U.S. farmers have never heard of a biocontrol. 28 have never heard of a biostimulant and 25% has never heard of a biofertilizer. Never heard. That's an, first of all, untapped market. Fantastic. When you compare that to Brazil, it's zero. They've all heard of biologicals in that country. And that is because, A, the government has a, a program about education in, in this whole regulatory process and what they kind of passed that went through this. Um, and so I just think, again, this is going to be an amazing test case for what happens when we make these things a little bit more transparent and a little clearer and we're talking about them. Um, you know, I think there is, there's a case for that, you know, farmers will use it. Um, and they'll be more open to using it if we talk about it in a clear way. Um, anybody want to chime in? 
Um, I, I am stunned by this chart, and I did see that Paul has joined us. Uh, Paul, who are you? What do you do? And, and thank you for uh, being a co-host of the conference that uh, Whitney's talking about. Yeah, sorry I joined a little late. I had a prior call, but uh, thanks for covering this topic. So we were asked by the organizer a year and a half ago to host this event. Um, and so hopefully everybody who attended thought it was a success. We'll see how it continues to grow. On this particular chart, uh, last year, this this World Congress was actually held in Rio. Um, and that I was kind of also blown away, uh, Whitney, by this graph you have here, because that's kind of what the message was, was Brazilian farmers have been somewhat forced to adopt the technology because they're seeing resistance, other issues with using too much chemicals on their land. Um, but because of that, the government, thankfully, there has been a lot more open to speed up the regulatory process to allow uh, registration to happen more quickly. I and mean, I think that's partly why there's been such wide adoption is farmers there not only are getting access to product, they're actually seeing it work. Um, and I think it's really improved, even I'm just looking at the numbers here, I think it's improved quite a bit from uh, what we were told last year. Um, it was funny, when I was there in Rio, I gave a challenge to all the farmers that were in the audience there to come here and teach us farmers how to make these products work. Um, unfortunately, I don't think we had it, very few, if any, farmers really attended the event. Um, but it could just have been timing. April may not have been the ideal time of the year to hold a program. Uh, one thing I find interesting is uh, on the whole adoption thing is why there hasn't been, I mean, what this chart here shows is the lack of education or never heard of. Why have, why have these solutions really been kind of hidden from U.S. farmers? Um, one thing I'm not seeing here is U.S. farmers clamoring for these solutions. And I don't know if that's because of pricing. Um, there hasn't been maybe enough efficacy shown. But I don't know, Whitney, have you found anything on that of why there's been lackluster adoption and, and interest and you know, lack of market pull here? Yeah, I think I think it's a lot. I think it's price. I think, like you said, we've originally we were thinking Let's get one tech, you know, one biological that fits everywhere for all crops, you know, so we see great efficacy in certain places and lousy efficacy in other places. So then people are like, oh, it's inconsistent when it's probably really consistent in a place that it works really well in, right? And it's just inconsistent because what works in Florida doesn't work in North Dakota or whatever. Um and, and so I think that, I think reg, reg, registration and regulatory, you know, it's it's prohibitive, really expensive for startups to go into biocontrol. Like I've heard, I've heard a lot of startups go, I think we have a technology that can do X, Y, Z in biocontrol, but we can't afford to bring it to the market. We can't, it's too, it costs too much money. Um, and the, you know, and the time, you know, the time to revenue is, is also huge, right? If it was costing a lot of money and you'd get revenue in two to three years, okay, fine. But you're costing a ton of money and getting, hopefully you get revenue in 10 years, right? So it's, it's insane. Um, and yeah, so, you know, I started out this presentation saying, we just don't know where that market is yet. The U S doesn't know what, what it looks like and how, how do we market these technologies in a way that resonates? We just haven't figured it out. I got another comment on that. Um, I was just wondering if anybody in this call um, has had any experience with anybody, either crop consultants, um, field trials, cooperative extension, I mean, other ways of trying to demonstrate that these products could work in the US. I was at an event a number of years ago in um, Georgia and there was a few trials where I think Georgia Cooper Extension had been using certain biological products, um, either for uh, antifungals or uh, anti-insects, um, and but didn't show efficacy. But when I talked with the companies, they said, "Yeah, it was because they didn't use the product as it was labeled. You know, they let it sit in a hot garage or barn for a month before they got along to the project." Um, or they didn't apply it or spray it correctly. So I'm just kind of curious if anybody else has stories. I mean, I, th I think there's a lot more education that's needed on how these need to be added. I think it's one area where Brazil has been a lot more successful is they're actually following the label and 
um, understanding that these are a lot more sensitive product. They're not just a glyphosate or other product, you know, chemical product. Um, so it was kind of concerning when I hear cooperative extension agents say, yeah, oh, we tried this and didn't see it work. But then the company said, yeah, it's because they didn't use it right. Um, I mean, that, there's certainly some barriers there that need to be broken. That is the... I'm going to be frank. That is the excuse that every company uses when they don't get efficacy in the field. Oh, they didn't apply it right. Oh, they didn't apply it right. Right. Because A, you can't prove it or disprove it. So what are they going to say? Right. B, again, it comes back to education and supply chain and how, you know, is it cold chain? Is it not? What, you know, who, how are you walking these people through using it? It's, it is different, you know, um, can it be applied with the equipment that farmers already have or is it different and if it's different how do you it's it's a it's a mess um in terms of of trying to get these um trials like these field day trials done well um i also think like these field trial field day trials tend to be not as prioritized right they just kind of throw product out to these places that do field days Hopefully they use it right and it goes. Whereas field trials for um, registration purposes and things like that, there's a little bit more energy put into them. Um, but again, that's just from my experience, like um, using it. But yeah, education, education, education. It just goes back to that. We have to educate everybody involved, consumer, distribution, extension, farmer. It's all that. All right, I'm going to go to my last one. Big data will be the key for the future success. We heard this this a fair amount at the conference. I've also just seen this trend for all industries, right? Big data is going to be the thing. Um, companies are leveraging AI for predictive selection for natural compounds. Prior to... This, these predictive algorithms, you basically just screened thousands and thousands and thousands of compounds, microbes, or whatever. Um, Novozymes had partnered with Monsanto before they were acquired to do this massive screening um, exercise. And basically, they leveraged Monsanto's field trial footprint, and they just put you know, a massive amount of like thousands of thousands of microbes out in the field to screen to see if the, any of it worked, right? Um, so it takes a ton of time and cost to screen all of these compounds. And that was just for microbes. If we're talking about natural compounds and things like that, that I brought up earlier, um, it's just a lot of time and, and cost. So what these predictive algorithms are going to do is come to the table with a smaller list. They're going to go through it and they're going to predict it. And the goal is to predict it with 95% success rate and weed out a bunch before we even had to take it to the lab. So this is going to decrease time to market. It's going to de decrease R&D cost um, and it's going to be, be awesome. Um, and then this is kind of my, my prediction. Um, the types of data that a company chooses to collect and protect will be their competitive advantage, right? We've all on this call have talked about ag data, right? It is not just selecting microbes to, to move forward, right? It's your weather data. It's your field data. It's your soil data. It's your cropping rotation. It's all of that data. And with the increased carbon market and all those carbon programs and all the soil sampling that needs to be done, what we're going to see is we're going to see strategic partnerships with companies based on the types of data sets that they have collected and protected, right? So let's just say one company has decided to put a ton of resources in soil sampling, and then another whole company has you know put resources into modeling microbes or whatever. Those two companies are going to come together purely based on their data sets and how to train algorithms. That's going to be the currency, which I think is pretty cool. <laughs> but again, that's my like, that is my like future, future thinking um, cap. Um, so yeah. So anyway, so that, 
that was talked about a little bit. Any any input? Well, I'm just curious to hear what Pablo has to say. <laughs> no, no, no. You've already used that ticket for this week. <laughs> no, I mean, it's... Whitney, again, hit the nail on the head. The question is, like, how do you communicate the need? And this isn't this isn't an agricultural problem, right? This is a this is a people problem. People are, for lack of a better term, lazy. They get comfortable with what they know and they get in the the daily rut of I got to do the things I got to do as opposed to going out there and looking for, you know, possibly bigger and better solutions. Right. So how do you communicate that to the farmers in such a way that it doesn't look like you're upselling, like the farmers actually going to get value out of the new product? Because it does come with an increased cost. And that's not just a fiscal cost. It comes with an increased cognitive cost because I've got to measure things out differently. I've got to think about how I'm going to do things a little bit differently. It's not exactly the same. And so you really have to show value to do that. But I'd be very interested if anybody did research um, on why it's so popular in Brazil as opposed to the States, right? Because let's face it, Brazil is a wonderful country, but they don't have near the economy that we have, which means that they're getting value out of it somehow. How do we translate that back to the U.S.? I do think, like Paul said, there there was a... What, what the last chat in two, we said people don't change unless there was a catastrophe, right? They, I think it's a dual thing. It, it's a bionomaticide. So a bionomaticide. So the nematodes have come into the soybean fields and have like, we're wiping them out and they were showing chemical resistance. I also feel like, and maybe Paul can correct me if I'm wrong, the government had outlawed a certain chemistry as well. So it was like the dual whammy. And I mean, they were getting wiped out by this nematode and the this bio nematicide was is completely taking care of the problem. So it was, they were definitely shoved down this pathway a little bit more than we have here in the States. Um, but they're riding it and, and growing it. They're not just stopping at that one technology. That's for sure. Yeah, I think Brazilian farmer farming is so intense, uh, intensive. I mean, they're doing they're they're dual cropping every year. So with um, instead of letting land sit fallow over the winter, I mean they're really let, uh, leveraging land to the max. Um, uh, and I think that's where they're seeing a lot of opportunity. In the biostimulants uh, is just getting a lot more yields from what they would get otherwise. Um, they have to import a lot of their product, their fertilizers and everything else. So uh, they're just seeing this work to their benefit of using biologics and they're seeing it work. Um, I mean, I think it's a one challenge. We, you know, I, I posed the question, should we leverage Brazil for all the biological products being developed? But most biological products don't necessarily work in crops in Brazil. So it's an interesting strategy to leverage um the understanding how to get biological products to work down there, as well as a regulatory system that may be more open to uh, getting things registered much more quickly. But it only works if you've got a product that works on sugarcane or Brazil. Um, if you're working on corn or canola or other crops, then maybe it's not the best fit. So it'll work with some companies. Uh, real quick before you leave, Franz, I have you worked with the company Copert? Copert? It's a marketing mm. company out of um, Finland. Anyway, looks familiar. Man. I'll I'll put it in the chat. They were at the conference and he they gave a really awesome um, marketing talk that was like very inspiring. Um, Copper Global, they're big down in Brazil. And I think part of their education was that this company has been part of that education marketing piece down there. Whitney, I joined late. Thanks for covering um, the outcomes of that event. Um, I missed your first three topics, but the topics I thought um, would be interesting is and I didn't know if you covered this, is opportunities for leveraging value in specialty crops. 
Um, I think a lot of companies in this space, they're going after major solutions and major row crops, but they never understand their go-to-market strategy. I heard you cover that. Uh, sometimes looking at something that may only grow on 40,000 acres as opposed to millions of acres, there may be better opportunity because those farmers typically are looking for, you know, they're higher value, higher profit opportunities potentially. So if you're looking at grapes, you're looking at sweet potatoes, you're looking at berries, um, you can maybe get the market better. Uh, that was one takeaway I had, but I didn't know if you covered that. Um, something I didn't hear as much, but I've heard from some of the companies is manufacturing bottlenecks. Uh, I think there's mm -hmm. strategies to help overcome that. Um, some products, if you've got a peptide, it may be a lot easier. Or if you're developing just a, a biostimulant based on um, uh, humic acid or something like that, that may be rather easy to produce and distribute. But if you're really doing a whole microbe, that's a whole different story. So that may have been part of the problem with like a company like AgBiome. Um, and last thing is, is leveraging formulation expertise. I mean, just yesterday, there was a, I'll post this in the chat, release uh, FMC forming a partnership with AgroSphere's, and that's largely for formulation. I heard a little bit of, of that at the event, but that may help ease um, the ability to better apply products, if you can better formulate it, especially with doing tank mixes with chemistry, um, that may be an upcoming wave of innovation in this space to help facilitate the use of more of these biologics. So those are some of the takeaways I had. Yeah, I talked about the fact that I think the industry has finally understood that these aren't standalone and that formulations and is going to be key to be able to tank mix it and all that kind of stuff. So, um, so yeah, I agree that has to catch up for sure. Well, good. This was a fruitful call. Uh, Whitney, thank you for uh, sharing all this information. Paul, thanks for jumping in late here. It's good to see you, buddy. I'm going to uh, stop the recording right now. And then,